Welcome to ThoughtCast, also podcast on the web at www.thoughtcast.org. I'm Jenny Atia. You might not have noticed, but we're living in a three-dimensional sinkhole on a weak gravity brain alongside an infinite, warped, fifth-dimensional space called the bulk. At least that's what the influential Harvard physicist Lisa Randall says might be the case. So far, all she has is a theory, but very soon now, this theory will be tested, and we'll find out if our universe is just one of many in a multi-dimensional, multiverse cosmos, or not. Lisa Randall, welcome to ThoughtCast. Thank you for having me here. Lisa, you've recently published a book called Warped Passages, Unraveling the Mysteries of the Universe's Hidden Dimensions. And though it's written for the layman, clearly these concepts are incredibly difficult ones to describe. Can you help us out? Give us a word picture of what you think of, what you see when you, when you think about this warped passage, this theory of yours. Uh, well, I'm going to start with a disclaimer and say that what I say in my book, which is that I think with extra dimensions, a word is worth a thousand pictures. It's just very hard to actually picture extra dimensions. It's really something we understand both mathematically and sort of abstractly, inductively. But basically what I do picture is something where we have a big higher dimensional space, that is to say extra dimensions we don't perceive. We might be stuck in one location in the extra dimension. That's this notion of a brain, which I'm sure we'll come back to. But it could be we're stuck in one place, but this extra dimension could extend either forever or just a finite distance away. But just the things that we're used to just by knowing about our three plus one dimensional world, the world with three dimensions of space and one of time, things can be dramatically different if there's another dimension. Now, a brain stands for a membrane. Right, so I should say a brain is spelled B-R-A-N-E. And the idea is that if there is an extra dimension, we might be in some fixed location in that extra dimension. That is to say, we might be on something that's membrane-like. So why do, why do we say membrane-like? Well, even just picture a shower curtain. If you have water droplets on a shower curtain, they're stuck on a two-dimensional surface in a three-dimensional room. And in the same way, we might be stuck on a three-dimensional surface. That is to say, this object called a brain even if higher dimensions exist, which would be to say that everything we're made of, atoms, the electrons in the atom, the galaxies, us, we're stuck on a brain. We only can travel in this three-dimensional regime, even though this extra dimension might exist. Well, let's take this apart a bit. We live, or at least we think we live, in a three-dimensional universe, and also there's the fourth dimension of time. But you're thinking of a fifth dimension. How would the fifth dimension operate? Well, one possibility is if there's a fifth or, or even more dimensions that they're just rolled up to a really tiny size. That is to say the dimensions are so small that they just don't have any observable impact on our world, at least yet. Another even more dramatic possibility that my collaborator Raman Sundram and I discovered in 1999 is you can have even infinitely large extra dimensions. It could be somewhat like ours in the sense that it extends infinitely far, but dramatically different in the sense that it's what we call warped. Now, what do we mean by warped? That's where the title of my book came from. We're, we're harking back to Einstein's theory of general relativity, which told us how gravity is encoded in the geometry of space-time. It could be that there is a fifth spatial dimension, but that gravity, if you like, or geometry is warped in that dimension. And it's a little hard to understand what that means, but you can almost think of the universe being funnel-shaped, or that things get rescaled as you go out in another dimension. They would be lighter or they'd be bigger as you go out into an extra dimension. So this warping of space-time is what makes it conceivable that this dimension can be infinitely big because gravity is so warped, space-time is so warped, that gravity might be highly concentrated in a region and not just dissipate out into the extra dimension, even if it's infinitely big. Lisa, is there any room in your theory for life on any of these extra dimensions or parallel universes? Um, there absolutely is room, not just in my theory, but any theory in which there are these extra dimensions. And in particular, if there are other brains, there's plenty of space for there to be other life. The life will very likely not be the least bit like ours. Um, the, one of the amazing things about this, these brains is that, it, let's, let's say it's true that everything we're made of, quarks and electrons and electromagnetism and strong nuclear force, let's say it's all stuck on our brain. That means if there is another brain, it would have fundamentally different chemistry, fundamentally different forces. It really would, in some sense, have different laws in nature. 
So we really don't know what's there. The only thing we do know, you might say, why do we care about it at all if it's so different? We do know gravity is shared among us, and therefore we can at least in principle communicate via gravity. So other things are not completely disconnected necessarily, but it could be very different and very hard to find. Now, as you said, there is a scientific basis for this. Mm -hmm. You're thinking mm -hmm. it's warped because it solves a problem. Well, what is the problem? Um, <laughs> the actual history of it is even more convoluted than that. We were trying to solve a different problem. And in the process, we worked out a particular space-time geometry where there were brains and a fifth dimension. And we found that it was warped. We hadn't put in that it was warped. It came out warped. And we realized that it really does solve a couple of scientific problems. One of them which is the one which is exciting because it will have testable consequences, is this question of the weakness of gravity. Really, it's a really big puzzle for particle physicists why gravity as a fundamental force is so much weaker than the other three forces we know about, that is to say electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces. It's um, hard to imagine that it's very weak, but if you think about it, you know, the classic example, you can pick up a paperclip with a magnet. That is to say, a tiny magnet can compete against the entire Earth. That is to say, the fundamental force is much weaker. If you were to separate two elementary particles and keep them a fixed distance apart, the force of gravity is totally negligible compared to the other forces. And it's not just a question of why is it so different. You might just be willing to accept it, even though it's an enormously big number. But it turns out that when you put together the principles of quantum mechanics and special relativity, your theory just looks almost inconsistent. It turns out you have to introduce an enormous fudge, what we call a fine tuning, to make the theory hold together and give predictions of the sort we know about. So the question becomes, is there a natural explanation for why gravity is so weak? And in this warped geometry, there is. And one of the implications that you draw is that we, our universe, is this somewhat irrelevant sinkhole with a rather limited 3D cognizance, so to speak, removed from the center of the action. We have this weak gravity, sort of leftover gravity. It's so contrary to the way people first started to think about astronomy, the Earth being, of course, the center of everything around which everything, including the sun, revolved. Uh, it's interesting how Every single piece of information that's been acquired has taken us farther and farther from the center. And really, if you think about it, that makes sense. You know, as individuals, we also think we're the center of the universe until we realize that, unfortunately, we're actually not. And really, as you know more about the world, you find out that what we see is not all there is. Um, I should say that you know, I'm a model builder. We don't know these, all these ideas are right. These are models. These are possibilities for how the world can work. And they might be all right together. Some of them might be right. We found it's possible that we live in a sinkhole. That is to say, although we experience three dimensions of space, it could be that there are other regions that don't. Before that, people, even when they thought about extra dimensions, it was thought that everywhere the dimensions are rolled up. So everywhere people would experience, or whatever there was, would experience three dimensions of space. What we found is that it could really be a local phenomenon. It really could be that we are in a pocket of space where we experience things as three dimensional even though elsewhere there's not. And I actually find it gratifying because I like the idea that what we see isn't all there is because it's probably true <laughs> that what we see isn't all there is. And maybe even to this extent, even the dimensions of space that we experience. Um, but the fact is that our personal limitations, that's an awful lot to impose upon the entire universe. It also feeds into the concept that if we, these puny thinkers on this neglected pocket of the universe are able to conceive of things beyond our own ability to visualize. Maybe there are other people doing this uh, who are far more ex advanced and it's <laughs> somehow, again, <clears throat> it smacks of some too much late night TV, but it's somewhat encouraging to know that we are not it. Or to, to, hope, to, uh, to make the assumption that we are probably are not it. <laughs> I try to spend not too much time thinking about this, but I do think it's awfully egotistical to think that we're all there is. I mean, it might be that we are all we will ever communicate with. It might be that other things are just well beyond what we're ever going to, but, but the fact that we haven't experienced other life forms certainly doesn't mean they don't exist. It, but they might be beyond anything we'll ever perceive. We just don't know. It must be a common question that you're asked by people like me rather than by your colleagues. Gee, is there life in that fifth dimension? 
it must have been an interesting process for you to communicate with the lay person about these ideas. What have you learned about us <laughs> in the process? You know, it, it's funny because a lot of the time the questions laymen are asking, the obvious questions, are the ones we, sometimes we forget to ask. For example, a question that people always ask me is, how many extra dimensions are there? And you know, for me, once I start thinking about extra dimensions, I mean, I might have particular theories that work in any number, but basically I'm willing to entertain the whole lot of them at the same time. But what occurred to me was, we hadn't really studied carefully the experimental consequences of different numbers of dimensions. So one of the projects I'm working on now is really trying to test. Can you tell how many dimensions there are? Suppose we discover them. Can you tell how many there are? So sometimes people are asking the right questions. So how many dimensions are there? <laughs> I'll tell you after we're done. Oh. <laughs> it's a secret. We want, we want answers, don't we? We want to know. I mean, you have been explaining a way of thinking that is somewhat alien. I'll, I'll just say alien to me. Uh, all of these possibilities you're playing around with without feeling that you necessarily have to commit to one. Well, this is a really, really good point. And especially in writing a popular book, I realized I was taking something of a risk. Because a lot of the times when people write these books, either there is a complete story or people act as if there's a complete story. But, you know, it's funny because as a kid growing up, I didn't find a lot of the books like this that entertaining or that I didn't really want to read them. And part part of what I like is not just someone telling me all the answers. I like, how do you know what the right questions to ask are? How are you going about trying to determine which are the right answers? Where are we now? How are you thinking about these things? So I try to give more a sense of the process by which we do science and how we get to these. I mean, we have these exotic ideas. Why am I saying they're science? How did we get there? How did we connect this to things that we do know? And so I think you know this is a really personal thing, whether people are comfortable with uncertainty or not. But the fact is, there is just a lot we don't know. And there's also a lot we do know. And I think it's really nice to really understand where we are. It would be simpler in some ways just to say, OK, these are all the answers. But in some ways, it's often unsatisfying because someone's just telling you all this stuff. And you don't have any way of judging how, or evaluating where it is. And so I'm trying to a little bit give the tools to evaluate what people are saying about what exists out there. So how comfortable are you with uncertainty and with working on ideas for five years at least that may or may not prove to be correct? Well, I guess I'm a gambler of sorts, but I like to hedge my bets. And so I'm perfectly happy to work on more than one theory at the same time. You're listening to ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia, and I'm talking with the leading Harvard physicist, Lisa Randall. She's an expert in theoretical particle physics and cosmology, and her new book is called Warped Passages, Unraveling the Mysteries of the Universe's Hidden Dimensions. Lisa, your theory is right out there on the bleeding edge of theoretical physics, but of course, string theory is pretty much the conventional wisdom in physics right now. Simply put, it claims that the fundamental building blocks of the universe aren't particles, like atoms or quarks, but tiny, one-dimensional, vibrating strings. And it also argues, as you've mentioned, for the existence of up to 10 dimensions, six of which are curled in on themselves and impossible to detect. But in your book, you write that you're agnostic about string theory. Are you in competition with these guys? Um, you know, we're all trying to find the answers. And basically, none of us know the answers yet. So we're trying to use whatever ideas are out there. As for us, we use ideas from string theory. After all, this whole thing is premised on the existence of extra dimensions and the existence of brains, these membrane-like objects. So, so I don't where think do you we're differ? This, where do you differ from, from the string theorists? It's really a question of approach and what you believe to take as solid. They're saying, we know string theory is right. We're going to derive the consequences. We're saying, we don't know what's right. We, the only things we really know are things that have been measured. And we're trying to say, what ideas, what theoretical framework can underlie phenomena we've seen. Why do we see the connections among masses and forces that we do? So it's not, I don't see it as competition. The methods maybe are different, but we're, we're really trying to work together. I mean, that's one of the nice things about the physics of extra dimensions of space. We really saw a convergence. I mean, sometimes people will say, I do string theory. I mean, it really depends on your perspective. What can we call your work? This well, work on warp <laughs> passages and infinite um, dimensions. People call it different things. I'm not too hung up on labels. Uh, one thing I call it in the book is model building. We're trying to find models. We're trying to find 
theoretical rubrics that can encompass the phenomena we've seen. And it does build in interesting theoretical ideas. We're not just doing Lego. I mean, there really are some ideas, as I said, from string theory. We're using the principles of general relativity. We're using the principles of quantum mechanics. But it's, it's a model. It's some way the world might work. It's how pieces might fit together. Now, as you mentioned, string theory is attempting to unite two different strands in physics. We have Einstein's general theory of relativity, and we have quantum mechanics neither of which is perfect. And as you've mentioned, they can conflict or seem inconsistent. Are you trying to come up with a, a theory, a grand unified theory like the string theorists, or is that not the tree you're barking up right now? Well, people often make a big deal about the fact that quantum mechanics and general relativity are in conflict. In fact, generally, they're pr pretty happy to live side by side. They don't really get into trouble. It's at infinitesimally small distances or really high energies that we run into problems. These are well beyond anything we're going to study experimentally, at least for at the foreseeable future. So it doesn't, it's not something we have to solve to address many of the questions we want to know the answers to. So we're not just looking for the total theory of everything, but we are trying to understand how to get beyond what we know. And if there is a theory of everything, such as string theory, what are its likely consequences for our world? So in some sense, it sounds like less ambitious questions, but in some sense, it's a major project because we're really trying to understand the phenomena we see. Can you encapsulate what your big idea is, what you're willing to go to the bank with right now? <laughs> um, I'm not sure what that question is. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, one of the ideas has to do with what we think might be experimentally testable. That is to say, this theory of the weakness of gravity. Another thing is, I think, the fact is that we found after 70 years of people not realizing that extra dimensions could be infinite, um, whether or not that's actually true in the world, that was an amazing theoretical consequence that physicists had missed for years. People who studied general relativity for a living had missed this. And we were coming at it from very di asking very different questions. And we you know, kind of stumbled across this amazing consequence, but we recognized when we found it. And so I think that was just a major advance, um, whatever happens. You're in a rather good position at the moment because these sorts of ideas have generally not been testable. But in a couple of years, as you know, a new particle accelerator is going to go online at CERN in Switzerland, a nuclear laboratory. It's called the Large Hadron Collider, and your theory will finally be put to the test. What will that test comprise of? Again, I have to be really careful here because it's one of our theories. It's the one that has to do with the weakness of gravity that will be tested. And the reason it's testable is because it's giving consequences for physical phenomena we observe, like the weakness of gravity. And we do know that this collider will have the right energy to test theories that could explain that. The consequences are quite remarkable. Basically, we know gravity is in the extra dimensions. And there can be gravitons. What are gravitons? They're particles that communicate the force of gravity. They're the analog of photons, which communicate the force of electromagnetism. And if there are extra dimensions, these gravitons can travel in the extra dimensions. And so you would not only see the graviton that we believe communicates the force we know about, but there would be heavier analogs of the graviton. That is to say, they would interact somewhat like a graviton, but they would have bigger mass. And because the collider will have high energy, and we know E equals mc squared, so high energy means you can make something with big mass, we would be able to make these particles that travel in the extra dimensions and they would have distinctive properties that would tell us that they are gravitons. And that would be conceivably evidence of extra dimensions, which we might find within the next five years. The machine will turn on in two years, but I'm not expecting to get all the answers right away. But within five years, we might know some answers. Now, just for clarity, Lisa, you're a theorist. You are not the experimenter. Right, that's absolutely right. And these experiments are so difficult to do, and the theory is difficult, that people do specialize. So I actually do theoretical work. I do interface with experimenters, so I will tell them things like what they might want to look for or how they might want to design their experiments at some level. Some of it is just so constrained we can hardly influence it. But sometimes you want to make them aware that they should be looking for particular things. And actually, when I was just visiting CERN very recently, this is this accelerator center near Geneva, it was very exciting because the experimenters do present our model as one of the first things that they might be able to look for. So this interaction is very important, but no, I don't do the experiments. You're listening to ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia. Lisa Randall, so far your career has been in one big upward swoop. 
You're the most cited theoretical physicist over the past five years. You were the first female theoretical physicist to get tenure at Harvard and at MIT. And you were also the first female physicist to get tenure at Princeton. All this has brought you fame, admittedly within the academic world, but fame has consequences. What has it been like for you? Um, I don't know that I'm famous. I don't really think I... Um, basically, I've been busier with my book out. And it's been nice actually hearing that people really are interested in these things. I mean, that's been quite rewarding. But I don't really think of myself as famous. Lisa, it's a bit of a sensitive question. But you and your book have been covered in the press, and there's always a very attractive photo of you, you know, accompanying the article and, and the dusk jacket. And I'm wondering if you think it's possible that a large part of the, the buzz around your book has to do with these marketing ploys around the fact that you are a young, attractive, brilliant woman physicist, rather than a man. It's such a funny question. Um, first of all, the idea that anyone would read a hard physics book because there's a picture of a woman on the cover is just so silly that I find it kind of hysterical. And um, although I think Stephen Hawking is a really great physicist and has written some nice books, but one could ask him the question, are people buying his books because the way he looks, you know, at least, at least as much. But the other thing is, no one would ever dare ask um, a guy, you know, so you're pretty good looking. So do you think that had anything to do with the sales of your books? I mean, if you look at a lot of the popular male authors out there, a fair number of them are quite attractive. No one ever says, well, how do you think this has affected your sales? Um, it's just, it's just, why is there this uh, double standard? And don't you think that it somehow is trying to diminish a little bit what's actually going on, the achievement that's actually there? And that's the danger, I think, is that you somehow are, there's, there's basically no winning solution when you're a woman. If you look bad, it's a problem. If you look good, it's still, either way, it can be used as a distraction. I just want to focus on what I think is really interesting, which is the physics. This issue of you being a woman and a physicist has often irritated you when people bring it up, it seems. Can you tell me what that's about? What is it that's, uh, to expand for a moment, obviously uh, there's been a huge uproar following the comments of Larry Summers, the Harvard president, about the possibility that women are innately less capable at doing math and science, and therefore that would explain why they're not filling the top positions in the academy in math and science. This is an issue that people always bring up with you. Here you are, this very successful female scientist at Harvard, but you've been quoted as saying that you're bored with this topic, and I want to respect that, but I want to understand it. Well, okay, so I don't mean that I'm bored with the topic. I actually find the topic really interesting and really important. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I did want to attract more women to the field and just make it clear there are women doing that. And so to the extent that we can do good by being out there, you know, the extent that this book does good, the extent that I'm out there and it does good, I mean, that's, that's rewarding. And if it's, people are really discussing the issue to try to improve things, well, I'm all for that. But if it's just like a curiosity thing, then it just gets a little bit annoying. <laughs> Disregarding your sex for the moment, You've been described as having a good instinct for physics, a good nose for physics. What do you, Lisa Randall, bring to the table as a physicist that's different from your peers, that's unique? Um, you know, that's always hard to answer about yourself. I do think that I um, just approach problems a little bit differently. And um, for me, I guess I always find like the sort of inconsistencies. I really like to find hidden connections and I also have very broad interests so that I can tie together different ideas. I mean one of the fun things about this work on extra dimensions is it really tied into many different areas of physics that I've worked on in the past and so we really tie together these different ideas and found connections that we would miss otherwise. But also just really puzzling. I, I really like puzzles so if something looks like it doesn't make sense, I mean a project I'm just completing with a student and one of the fun parts for me was seeing you know, when the calculations didn't work, like why didn't they work, and just really trying to, that's where all the interesting stuff lies, and that's just the, you know, the way my mind works, I guess. A greater comfort with process than many of your colleagues, perhaps. Well, probably a lot of them do. I mean, it's hard, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but I think another thing, certainly I realized writing the book, again, um, compared to the rest of the world, is I can have a lot of different thoughts in my head at the same time. It doesn't bother me. And it's one of the things that made writing a challenge for me, to really turn this complicated story into some linear story, 
where you really go one idea after the other. And that was really a, a real learning process for me. And it was, it was fascinating just to see how, because in some sense, that isn't the way it is. I mean, we really do have all these ideas and they pour into each other. But what is the order in which you'd, you'll understand it the best? What is the way to present it? But I think that comfort with having all these things, I think that's what makes, but I think in the end, it's also what makes the story richer. I mean, there's a reward for having all of that and that's worth it. When these ideas are in your head, swimming around, what is it like? What are you doing? Are you actually doing something else when you get your inspiration? <laughs> are you focusing? Do you have a sense of how your ideas come to you and how you distinguish perhaps the ones that are worth pursuing from the ones that perhaps are not? Um, so I know there are definitely times that I'll just sit on my couch and figure something out. So there is that kind of process. But then there's just going and really working out the consequences and just really thinking them through. Sometimes driving in a car, you'll think about what, what would this mean? But there's also back and forth. I mean, one of the things that was really great, especially in the initial stages with Raman, was a real back and forth. You know, we would have an idea, you no, know, that couldn't possibly work. You know, so you have, so if there's always one person trying to drive an idea forward and one person being skeptical, you're, you're <laughs> gonna figure it out. And even if those roles change, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's, because all of us as scientists, we have both of those in us, and that's what makes it so interesting. Is you, on the one hand, you really want to push your idea forward, but on the other hand, you don't want to be wrong. Um, you know, I think some people have said just about academics in general, they're, they're the both simultaneously the most and least confident people in the world. And I think it's kind of required. It's a way of thinking about things, that you can really be, have an idea that you think is worth pursuing, but also that you think it's worth questioning. These are skills you've obviously developed very well. Can you apply any of these skills to other issues uh, outside of science? Can you apply them to the soft sciences or to everyday life? The problems of politics? The problems of world hunger? Well, I like to think so. <laughs> I like to think that I, if only I could be there, I could solve all the problems of the world. Um, I mean, I definitely think that there are ways of thinking about things that we do bring to the table that we just that physicists in general have a sort of logical way of thinking about things. But of course, you know, physicists are notorious for thinking they know the answers to everything. As you said, physicists are also willing to be skeptical about their own ideas. But you have said that you believe in extra dimensions, which is an interesting word to use, believe. Um, but I'm still skeptical. I mean, it's, you know, the question is, what do I think? Well, I think at some level there's probably extra dimensions out there. They might. I mean, it could be so small we would, wouldn't even know really that we should be calling them dimensions, but I think they're very likely something there. But I'm willing to be proven wrong. I'm not, I'm not going to believe it in the face of evidence that contradicts me. It's just um, what I think is likely to be the case. Well, a rendezvous in 2007 at uh, CERN, <laughs> there perhaps. We go. There we go. Lisa Randall, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You've been listening to ThoughtCast, also podcast on the web at www.thoughtcast.org. I'm Jenny Atia. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.